Dr. Miller with the Little Journal Club. Um, if, I think you'll find this one interesting. Uh, one of the more popular um, recovery modalities right now, and that's foam rolling. So I have an article here called Foam Rolling Prescription, a Clinical Commentary by David Bam. And I think it's Bam or Bam. Bam, um, Dr. I'm going to say Dr. Bam. Forgive me, Dr. Bam, if you ever, I don't know why you ever watch this video, but, um, and then a host of other authors. Uh, Dr. Bam is famous for his um, articles in uh, neurophysiology. Uh, related to strength training, uh, Bam and Sales article 1983, I think it was, uh, and that's kind of highlighted the mo the importance of the intent to move, right? So the load is light or heavy, it's the intent to move. Neuro drive, like this is the first kind of thinking about neuro drive. So anyway, it's kind of a classic article. Um, a well um, accomplished researcher, but this article is called Formal Learning Prescription and Clinical Commentary. It's it's a it's basically um, it is a commentary, of course, uh, but it also makes the attempt to um, almost like form as uh, serve as a meta analysis of at the time of this article, 2020, of trying to uh, figure out what is the optimal prescription for foam rolling and, you know, like how long do you do it? Um, how many times should you do it? Um, and then what's the positive or negative effects of using a foam roller? By the way, if you haven't already subscribed to my channel, I'll let you watch the rest of this video before you have to decide if you like it, though. All right. So I'll give you that opportunity. Um, smash the bell because I think that's what that's what everybody on YouTube says. So I'm gonna guess that's what I'm gonna guess that helps the algorithm of some sort. So anyway, smash the bell if you wouldn't mind. Um, I'm trying to become a world famous YouTuber without um, having a well developed six pack and um, looking good in tight fitting clothing. I have a little bit tight or tight shirt on here, and I can tell you it doesn't. Uh, I don't really look that good in it. So anyway, I could use all the help I can get. All right. Um, so I won't I won't belabor this one too much. Um, basically, at um, the uh, the uh, um, come on brain, the authors of the article <laughs> accumulated the available research at the time, and then just came up with. And, and there's some um, some statistical ways that this was done. Some um, algorithms that were developed as a result of uh, looking through the available research. Okay, and what I'm gonna do is hit the highlights here. Um, any study that's like this, and I, I use the word study here, even though it's a commentary. Um, any meta analyses. The tendency is many times, if you're not familiar with the meta analyses, is, is it takes all available research and runs statistics on them and then determines the general trend of those studies um, in the terms of their outcome. Okay, so a meta analysis is an essential study of a study. Now, um, I, I fall into this trap early on too with these type of studies is that you think, well, I mean, more, more data, more better, right? But you have to remember that when a meta analysis is done, one of the most important things is the selection criteria of the meta analysis. So, um, did they throw out some studies? Did they keep some studies that they shouldn't have, right? Uh, the, the compilation of the studies determines the meta-analyses. So, if, you know, if I had, you know, 15 studies and um, 10 of them were positive results in varying degrees of significance, uh, like in practical significance, and they say they're all statistically significant, but they're varying degrees of practical significance, effect size, if you're familiar with it. Um, but they're all pointing in the positive direction. I only had maybe two or three studies that um, were, support that the the intervention didn't work and their effect was really low, um, then you're going to have a biased r result. Now you could say, well, yeah, duh, that's the whole point, right? Like there's, there's 10 good, 10 quote unquote positive studies for this thing and five against or whatever I said, five against. And that's fine if that's the available studies. But if you ejected five to six of the studies that were negative, right, towards the outcome, and I don't, I don't think a researcher would do this maliciously, but if for some reason those studies were identified as, as not as part of the of the group, and and most good meta analyses will tell you why, then that could that could sway the results. Okay, is what I'm getting at. Um, it's, research is hard, and this is not a knock on research. This is just, it's more of a, 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 a like when I teach my students is you got to think critically. You can't just pick up an article and be like, yeah, yeah, that sounds great, right? You have to think critically about things. Um, research is wrought with error. You have humans studying humans reviewed by humans, like the articles, the research is reviewed by humans. Well, there's, yes, more eyeballs is helpful, but it doesn't mean that error won't exist. Humans are still humans. That's why it's easier to study like rats and stuff. Okay. So I say that before I review this article, I said that before, it's just to keep some of the, um, the recommendations that came out of this article in mind. So, um, in terms of, uh, what this commentary is basically pulled in, uh, is and then ran some um, some different a different type of stats than you might find in a meta. And in fact, the re the the author does a good job of saying you know why this wasn't in a meta analysis, and it was because of, of a lack of um, heterogeneity. Let me just read it. This article this year in the volume of the heterogeneity of the performance data were insufficient for a meta analysis. So in other words, this this there's just not enough data to support a meta analysis. Okay. 
um, the, the author also also had prom, uh, already published a meta-analysis on foam rolling. <laughs> okay, so I say all that says why wasn't this a meta-analysis? Why was this done using a dis- different statistical analysis? Well, those are the reasons given. Okay, um, it's it basically what what this article did is it looked at all the variables and made regression equations um, as a result. And so if, if a regression equation is like um, if you've ever done body composition calculations or used a calculator to but there's a regression equation behind that so you, you put in some variables um and what comes out is a very the regression equation will tell you what variable is the most important and it'll tell you the weight of those variables um as well and so um the this commentary used that statistical approach in order to tease out um prescription guidelines for the formula all right again is that a perfect method no um is it still something valuable to um, aggregate all the available data at the time? Yeah, I think so. And I think you'll find that um, I, I think we tend to we tend to go with research sometimes and then throw out what we see with our eyeballs. So anecdotal evidence, right? Now anecdotal evidence is lower on this the scale many times when it comes to levels of evidence, of course. But it's okay to check clinical or to check research evidence or evidence out of the research literature with anecdotal evidence that's been provided by your eyeballs and your experience and your coworkers, right? And you sync the two, you, you know, they, they complement each other and you can refine then in different populations. Perhaps you have this article, it's uh, research that says, you know, X, uh, treatment works this way. And you're like, well, it doesn't really work with them, but it works with these other people. Right. And then you look back at the article and it was like, well, yeah, it didn't really address, um, you know, it was the wrong population, the population that should work with everybody. No, it doesn't really work with everybody. Cause I had people that were not in that population in the study. Uh, and lo and behold, the people that does work with are the people that were in the same research study. So those are things like it could be men and women, right? It doesn't work with men, it works with women, whatever the, whatever the intervention is. All right. So I say all that as a backdrop um, that when I give these, these guidelines that were provided from this research, um, they should still be viewed with skepticism. It doesn't mean they're not good. This wasn't a, like this wasn't a well done study. Um, but I, th- I think you can still use your eyeballs and you'll see that any good range, um, any good prescription, if you will, there's a range, right? And that should, you know, as long as, as long as you're within the range, you're probably in good shape. And most people do this. There's one, there's one part of this though. I want to point out where most people, I kind of made a joke about it, but most people mess up when it comes to foam rolling. So again, if you're not familiar with foam rolling, um, the idea, there's different ways to do it. There's trigger point therapy. And it used to be And the article talks about, you know, some of the reasons why foam rolling would work. And we don't really understand all the mechanisms. Um, it's traditionally called self myofascial release. And so the idea originally was, that fascial bags that you know, so if you ever because everybody just looks at cadavers right if you've ever seen a cadaver um the musculature uh, typically when you by the time you view a cadaver they the individuals who who open the body have dissolved out the connective tissue a lot of the fascia and so fascia runs through the muscle and it runs it runs around it and around each muscle is a fascial bag as well as connective tissue and so if you had quadricep muscles that are you know if you've ever seen a cadaver you know that it doesn't it doesn't look anything like your anatomy book and it's you know a lot of these tissues are smashed together right i mean a quadricep is really compressed together it's a small space they're not as clearly delineated until you look and try to find the you know the tendons and the connective tissue pieces but these fascial bags around each muscle it's, the idea is that they could stick together and they could rub together and if they get hung up that a foam roller would break on these adhesions now from what i understand we've never really from what i've read we've never really seen this adhesive problem um occur and so while foam rolling produced um, seemingly produced anecdotal results in terms of recovery and feeling better and um, flexibility increases, mobility increases, um, it, it probably isn't due to the to myofascia. And so this article points out it's probably not a good name for this anymore. Um, we just I think that's why it's called foam rolling a lot of times too. Um, but it appears to be a lot, what drives a lot of this is neuro, neurological, right? So uh, disruption of um, receptors, or it could be manipulation of the Golgi tendon organ. It could be a lot of different factors that play into, and there's certainly neuro that play into um, why a foam roller tends to relax a muscle. I mean, you can you can do mobility techniques um, on a really stiff joint and gain you know 25, 30 degrees range of motion. If you did PNF stretching, I mean, it just shows you. You know, I do this in this lab with the students to show them that you know most of the time we think of stretching as a um, you know, morphological change to, uh, you know, like a tendon or something like that. And that certainly can happen over time. But why is it that we can gain 25, 35 degrees range of motion in a stiff person um, at the hamstring by using PNF techniques? Well, obviously you're not destroying tissue. You shouldn't be. 
um, but you're having some neural effect that's occurring, right? There's some neural guarding, I'm going to call it, right? Um, that's inhibiting the, the ability for the muscle to relax, or there's some excitation that's keeping the muscle on, or however, you know, um, I'm not a neurologist. I've tried to study a lot of neurophysiology, and it's, um, it's definitely not my expertise when you go down into those levels, uh, but it's still fascinating. It's still fascinating. So when we look at this article, it talks about some of those mechanisms, and it'd be worth just picking up just to kind of follow up with some of those things. But let's just go over the the the, re, the outcome of this study. Again, it walks through the selection criteria. Some of that criteria included uh, full only full articles, so in other words, no abstracts. Healthy individuals. I'm just looking at this. I paused for a second so I make sure guys. Performance of foam rolling or roller massage. No manual massage testing. Testing of acute effects of range of motion or selected performance measures, jump height or power, or sprint, and stuff like that. Uh, publication in the um, English peer-reviewed journal. And just because we didn't get any um, definition issues, and if a trial examined both acute within experimental sessions, measures were taken immediately or ten, within 10 minutes after the intervention. So you're going to be limited now uh, for any study that might have looked at 30 minutes post, right? Um Rolling combination of the treatments for pathological populations. So, oh, sorry, that's sorry. The backup exclusion criteria was studies involving only chronic training effects. Um, so, over the course of many sessions. Okay, this is a study. This this particular view is pertaining to acute effects within ten minutes. Okay, in healthy individuals. Um, other exclusion was rolling combination with other treatments, which would be very interesting, right? I mean. We like to, reductionism is important because we can at least identify some effect that the, the something foam rolling might have by itself, but perhaps foam rolling is best done with, um, you know, doing some resistance training. I, I don't know. I'm just making that up, but you don't know. Or a pathological population, so injuries or something like that. Okay, abstract, abstracts were excluded, as I mentioned before, okay? So from there, the data was accumulated, a total of 73 articles, and 254 measures were used in the analyses. Um, and there's a nice little flow chart in here as well, um, which is very helpful when you look at meta-analyses or these, this isn't a meta-analysis obviously, but when these larger, st um, studies that can give you a better picture of, you know, what kind of studies went into it. And, you know, some of the, um, some of the, the highlights, uh, you know, of the excluded ones were manual massage, 20 of them, 21 of them, chronic training studies, there were four of them that were excluded, uh, f you know, 14, um, Abstracts and, and 25 reviews were exclu excluded. It really makes sense with the reviews. Um, so, you know, then you can see what was included and why. And so um, uh, you get all the way down to the bottom at 73 articles. Okay. So anyway, that's just a little background of of where the data came from. And if, if you, know, you have to decide for yourself, if you think this type of statistical com compilation is um, effective in turning, uh, producing the outcome that this study provided in terms of recommendations. Okay. Um, uh, the big part of this analysis was um, looking at the effect size then for uh, for each one of these differences. So like uh, how long a set was, okay? Um, how many sets were done, right? And uh, the regression equation essentially plots a line about um, where did the, the greatest effects occur among these different variables, among these different studies. So for example, um, the number of sets, so if, if I can't, I don't want to show you this because it's copyright, but like the number of sets, there was more um, accumulation of uh, effect size that was uh, meaningful. So right, when you get an effect size, uh, you know, over one and not just trivial effects, um, that the, the line basically bends up when you get a number of sets between two and three. Okay. So another number of rounds of foam rolling was around two to three when these effect sizes from each study were plotted. All right. And it appears like in this one's uh, somewhere in between two and three, um, when the effect size of set duration was plotted, right. Then in terms of how many seconds it was, you know, you get the line bent up around eh, a little over 120 seconds. So now you're getting a range of, if you look at the curve, if when, it, you know, when it starts to crest, when it starts to reach its apex and starts to come down, um, you can get a, a good idea. Like um, there was studies that had uh, over 300 seconds and their effect size then started to drift towards zero. So in other words, longer rolling didn't seem to be as effectual um, when it came to um, what this, whatever the study was determining, whether that was um, better range of motion, jump height or something like that. Um, it, it, this is the kind of, this is how the, the analysis works. Okay. Hopefully that's not too confusing. So you take the study's effect size or whatever they're trying to study. What was it? And then you plot it 
depending on these different variables, set duration of phone rolling, number of sets, um, you know, um, rolling frequency, right? Uh, you know, how many times, okay? Um, so hopefully that's helpful, okay? Now, what's the results? What did, what did these are what did this article find after I'm trying to explain the methods? And you can I, I probably clunkily explained that the methods, but here's the deal: you have to understand the methods of a study in order to appreciate the results. Because if we don't critically evaluate the method methods and we run away with the results, um, you know, if you just get to the, like in the strength condition journal has the practical applications in, if you just go to that and say, okay, this is the way it is, uh, and again, uh, kind of a silly example would be like this was done. The study was done on ostriches, and you're talking about humans. Right. Or, you know, this study was done in lampreys and you were, done, I mean, right. I mean, we skipped all the important details here. So anyway, the practical applications after running these regression analyses in the 73 studies and looking at where the effect size tended to, be, to pile up um, was that uh, when it came to um, looking at uh, promotion of changes of range of motion. Okay. So within 10 minutes following, and these are all important caveats within 10 minutes following foam rolling, um, the prescription was, and this won't be re probably a shock to anybody, but should in involve one to three sets, so one to three rounds, right, of two to four second repetition duration, okay, and I'll talk about in a second, for a total rolling duration of 30 to 120 seconds per set, okay, and then we're talking about per muscle now. Let's say you, you foam roll your hamstrings, okay, and you want to know how to optimally do it in order to achieve some sort of immediate um promotion of range of motion, something that's significant and not trivial, um, large magnitude, in other words, uh, a, a large effect size. So it's something that's going to be practically significant as well. Okay. It's not just like it was an improvement of uh, 1%, one, you know, one degree of range of motion. It's something that's going to be significantly practical for that particular muscle and the range of motion associated with the joint that, that's connected to that muscle or muscles. Okay. So one to three sets. So you're going to do it one to three times. You're going to foam roll your hamstring. Each repetition duration is two to four seconds. Um, full length of the muscle. So, you know, one Mississippi, two Mississippi, three, but that's, that's rolling down, okay? And that's it's slow is what I'm getting at. I, you know, I said, you know, many times people foam roll and, and they just kind of roll around like they're starting a campfire, right? Um, roll slowly, two to four seconds, slow down, okay? Let the foam roller apply pressure and a, a, you know, give it more time under tension, if you will, ex execute more time um, that the tension occurs during the actual cadence of the movement um, with a total duration of 30 to 120 seconds per set. Okay, 30 or so. If you did, um, you know, I think most people do roughly 30 seconds, in my experience anyway, uh, and well, sometimes faster. But and you get on the foam roller and you foam roll at a two to four second cadence. You foam roll for 30 seconds minimum, maybe even a full minute. And then you go to the left hamstring. If you did the right, you did the left now and do the same thing. And by the time you're done with that, you go back to the right again, okay, back and forth. You do that between one time. You could just do it once uh, up to three sets to gain benefit, all right? Now, the second part of this um, research was does foam rolling produce any benefit or detrimental effects on um, at least the two variables that we're talking about here in the generic term strength and jump performance? And Rolling does not induce meaningful. It was a trivial, meaning not very much, uh, uh, strength and, and jump performance deficits. Okay, um, it does not induce meaningful strength. So there's a trivial effect. So you know the big knock on foam rolling, um, and I still it depends on the person. I'm, I'll get to that in a second. Is that if you foam roll, okay, does it slacken the muscle, if you will? Reduce the tension in the muscle to the point where, you know, you got to pull the slack out of the muscle in order to, this is what static stretching is thought to do, right? If you, if you stretch the muscle and you, then you try to do something powerful or, or that revolves strength, you've taken the slack out of, the, you've taken the tension out of the muscle. Now the muscle isn't going to perform as well, but it'll be warmed up. And eventually that's why you might do foam rolling and then go out and do your warm up, your traditional warm up, And you get the benefits of the range of motion increase for 10 minutes, at least according to this study. By doing it the way that's outlined here and recommended from the research that's available, um, and then you warm up, and the muscle is, um, for a variety of reasons, now potentiated and activated and ready to go. Okay, so foam rolling could be nice in that respect. However, it doesn't appear from this particular group of articles that the foam roller even really has any effect on strength and power at all, um, at least in the you know the variables that were in each one of these studies. And so you could say I can just go foam roll and go do something powerful. So what would be interesting to do something like, um, maybe there's studies out there that have done this probably, 
is foam roll and then lift foam roll and lift especially for those that um you know you could do mobility drills like i use fillers so you have tight uh you know terrible dorsiflexion and you can't sit down and squat why don't you foam roll your calves in between some of you probably do this already right i know athletes that i work with do already but like it'd be nice to quantify how much and um does it help so the good news is that if you foam roll that musculature that you're trying to loosen up, I use the calf in this example, which isn't a great driver in a squat, but you know that you're not going to have any negative effects associated with rolling the muscle. Okay. The last thing I'll say here that it's a caveat to this study. And again, the study is great. It accomplished what it needed to accomplish, um, what it set out to do and get these ranges, is that when it comes to mobility work, the where the individual starts is very important. So if somebody is hyper stiff, and I use that word purposely, if somebody's hyper stiff, and you may know hyper stiff people, and if you foam roll them, they probably will gain more of a, a profound positive effect from the foam rolling in terms of performance than somebody who's hyper mobile. Is uh, hyper mobile, in other words, they're really flexible, and they foam roll. They could have a detrimental effect from foam rolling. So, is a, it there? The it depends factor here is big, and this particular article doesn't really address that. It just says healthy adults, and that was not the goal of this article. Um, so keep that in mind. If you're a hyper stiff person, you may, in fact, anecdotally see that you perform a lot better because now you the range of motion that you are lacking in order to perform optimally has been established. For somebody's hypermobile, I'm using extremes here. Now you're, the muscles are even have more laxivity in them, and so they're going to be even less powerful um, than they were before you stretched. So for some people, foam rolling may not be a good idea. Now we also have to go regionally. I mean, you might have tight hamstrings but not tight calf musculature. Or you might have the vice versa. If you do distance running, you might have tight calf musculature, but not tight hamstrings. So you may need to spend more time on the calf musculature and the hamstrings. So this this article just provides some context, uh, provides some guidelines, I should say, and uh, recommendations for um, for how long. And I'm going to highlight the cadence, slow down uh, when foam rolling. Um, but there's all these other factors still in play, right? And this is where you you know you got to use your critical thinking skills to figure out if you're a coach or if you're you know you're th thinking about yourself. Who are you, right? And each muscle is different, and each joint is different. Um, it's associated with the muscles around it, and right, what's what's appropriate for you, and then apply these recommendations. All right, I'm at 22 minutes. Wow, I really yammered on this one. Sorry about that. Um, I'll see you in the next video, and I hope you found this one valuable.